A young man stands in his bedroom. It just so happens that today, the 13th of April, 2009, is this young man's birthday. Hi, my name's Callan, and unfortunately I'm going to be recapping Homestuck. The first few pages of Homestuck introduce us to our protagonist for the time being, John Egbert, who faffs about his cake-infested room, clogging his Silidex with random garbage. The Silidex is the character's inventory in Homestuck, and right now John is using a stack fetch modus, which means he can only access the item that he's capsulogged most recently. Of the first 200 pages of Homestuck, like half of them are inventory management jokes. John anxiously awaits the overdue arrival of a beta video game called Spurb. We learn this from a conversation with his friend Turntet Godhead via the chat platform Pesterchum. Most of Homestuck's dialogue is conveyed through these pester logs, and you get a great sense of each character's personality just from how they type. Donning a clever disguise, John goes downstairs to faff around even more in his clown-cluttered house, spilling his grandma's ashes and unwrapping a giant Harlequin doll from his father. We meet another one of John's friends, Tentacle Therapist. Fun fact, when I first read Homestuck, I concatenated Tentacle Therapist not into two words, but into three, so Tentacle the... Tentacle Therapist is also interested in playing Spurb and urges John to finally check the mail. The mailbox is empty, but John's father has left some of the mail in the car. John spies his Spurb beta through the kitchen window amidst the fumes of fervent baking. Something about John's dad was always very attractive to me, maybe just because he's a featureless fan so I can assume he's as handsome as I want him to be, or it's the fact that he's a dad. In the kitchen, John strives with his father in a battle of practical jokes. Thanks to some inventory shenanigans, the smoke alarm goes off and John's able to abscond with his father's PDA, a package from TG containing the movie authentic bunny from Con Air, and his Spurb beta. In his room, John installs the Spur Beta and connects to TT, who is now able to manipulate the dimensions of his house with the expense of something called Build Grist. She also deploys three gadgets called the Totem Lathe, the Crux Truder, and the Alchimeter. While figuring out the controls, she disembowels his bathroom waterworks. John chats with his third friend, Garden Gnostic, learning that the package in his dad's car is from her. Unfortunately, his father has gone to the store to procure more baking supplies. With TT's help, John bashes the Crux Truder with a sledgehammer, expelling a Cruxite dowel and a wobbling orb that TT identifies as the Kernel Sprite. They prototype it with the Harlequin doll as a timer appears, counting down from 4 minutes and 13 seconds. As John discovers a comet barreling toward his house, TT's internet connection cuts out, trapping him in his bedroom with a bathtub. With two minutes remaining until John goes splat, we meet our second character. Meet Rosalond, aka Tentacle Therapist. Rose must restore her internet connection to save her friend John from an impending meteor. Avoiding her mother, Rose braves the torrential downpour outside that fails to put out the forest fire encroaching upon her house. In her house's observatory, Rose is able to gank the wireless signal of the nearby laboratory and reconnect to John, freeing him from his room. Rose has already deployed a pre functioned capsule log card, which John uses to carve Cruxite Dowel, the totem lathe. The alchimeter reads this dowel and produces a tree, which drops an apple into John's waiting hands. John takes a bite just in time, transporting his entire house out of the path of the meteor. This ends Act 1. Act 2 opens on a game FAQ post from Rose, which recaps the plot in purple prose. Cryptic panels show a shrouded figure called the Wayward Vagabond exploring the desert. WV stumbles upon an underground facility where he's able to issue commands to John via a computer. When he accidentally toggles the caps lock key, this opens a vault of canned food. Rose's laptop dies, dropping the car containing John's gift from GG and his Spurb server copy into the newfound abyss beneath his house. John informs GG that her gift is lost and recruits TG to get Rose into the game and away from the forest fire. Unfortunately, TG has lost his Spurb copies and must retrieve his brothers. In a flashback to earlier that day, we meet Dave Strider, aka Turn Tech Godhead, a katana wielding cool guy with ironic shades. Silidex shenanigans spill apple juice all over Dave's turntables and spurb copies, the latter of which is snatched by a rambunctious crow which Dave accidentally shish kebabs, rendering them long gone on the rooftop below. Meanwhile, Rose recounts the battle of passive aggressive one upmanship she's waged against her mother, who she faces in a strife where she's gifted a pony named Maple Hoop. Her mother placated, Rose absconds to the backup generator by her cat Jasper's grave, which she defiles. John discovers his house to be lousy with oily imps who have adult napped his father. With significant effort, he dispatches one, earning some build grist and a few rungs of his echoladder, which is an all but meaningless level progression system. John's sprite, which has accidentally been prototyped a second time with the ashes of his nana, reveals herself an info dump spur blore in a sprite log. When John arrived at the medium, his kernel sprite hatched, sending one half each to a kingdom of light and dark and ending their eternal stalemate. John now must build his house up to reach seven gates and explore the medium while answering the ultimate riddle. If that sounds cryptic and obtuse, it's because it is. Dave strikes out into his apartment to find his brother's copies of the spur beta so that he can rescue Rose from imminent immolation. Dave's bro is into puppets and performs a rapping ventriloquist act with Lil Cal. When RuPaul said that everybody loves puppets, she meant me, I'm everybody, but I don't love puppets in the way that Dave's bro loves puppets. Rose deploys the Punch Design X, another gadget that allows John to experiment with the punch card based alchemy that created the apple that first brought him to the medium. By punching cards with the capture codes on the back, John can recreate capture logged items, and by overlapping those cards at the totem lathe stage, he can devise wacky new combinations. John also punches a card with a random sequence, creating an inoperable rocket pack. John dozes off, seeing premonitions of the future in the clouds and the silhouette of a mysterious girl, but awakens to find two boss monsters staring him down. It's Dave's turn to capture log random garbage as he weaponizes his Silidex in preparation for a rooftop brawl with his brother, all while 
pursued around the apartment by Lil Cal. Opening the roof access, Dave is buried head to toe in puppet ass. Dave persists up to the roof where we get a double psych out and return to the Wayward Vagabond. Starring, without a can opener, WV elects himself mayor of Can Town and gobbles everything else in the room without regard for edibility, dispensing some foreshadowing along the way. He fiddles with the computer and discovers a countdown from 4 hours and 13 minutes. In another room of the underground bunker, he discovers an a purifier, which he uses to rescue a firefly encased in amber. He dubs it Serenity, which I can only assume is a reference to Firefly, which would have been cool in 2009 when we still liked Joss Whedon. As the countdown ends, the bunker, which we can now see as a giant can, sails across a ruined earth and comes to rest at the base of a frog temple. With brief glimpses of John's father, Dave, and Rose, Act 2 ends and it's time to round out the initial cast. In Act 3, Homestuck becomes debilitatingly non-linear, but I've done my best to unspin that spaghetti. Jade Harley, a forgetful narcoleptic, awakens in her greenhouse. She possesses semi-clairvoyance and a passion for anthropomorphic fauna. Jade leaves her house to deliver an irradiated steak to her friend Rick Quarrel and retrieve a month's late birthday package from John. However, she first must strike with her grandfather, which is rendered exceptionally silly by him being taxidermy. Carcinogeneticist, a troll, messages Jade, and she does not like him one bit. John, Rose, and Dave have also spoken to trolls on their own. Turns out the Quarrel is a god dog and teleports Jade across space time as they strife. Jade snags John's package by getting Beck to play fetch and promptly falls asleep. While dreaming, Jade simultaneously operates a dream self in the game world and a robot self in the real world. She explores a city of light which we have yet to learn is called Prospet. As Prospet intersects with Sky, the planet orbits, Jade sees John's dream self and premonitions of the future in the clouds that direct her to the frog temple by her house in the waking world, where she delivers John's present, which disappears. Serendipitously, she also finds Dave's beta copies in a time capsule. This ends Jade's involvement in Act 3. Meanwhile, Dave is being beaten up by Lil' Cow. At the end of Act 2, Rose's mother opened a tunnel to a secret lab in Jasper's mausoleum, which Rose now finds. Inside, a machine tracking global meteor impacts counts down to the lab's destruction. Rose powers her laptop, drops Jasper's onto a disintegratificator, and acquires a scarf and mutant kitten. And a purifier is fixated on a past version of Jasper's, which someone else once used to make Jasper's disappear right after he told Rose a devastating secret. Rose fast forwards and finds Jasper's deceased and well, so she flees through what is in fact an escapalizer. Arriving in her mother's bar, Rose watches a meteor destroy the factory she just escaped. This sets a lot of things on fire, chiefly her house. In a dark city, which we have yet to learn is called Durst, John's father breaks out of prison but endears himself to his frivolity hating ward and arch agent Jack Nor by burning his house. Meanwhile, Dave is getting beaten up by his brother. In the future, an apple shaped vehicle takes off, carrying the peregrine mendicant. She likes mail. Already arrived at PM's destination, the wayward vagabond accidentally appearifies Jade's present from John, which she's completed with a note. The note tells WB to give the package to PM, but they both take fire from the aimless renegade compelled by law to execute the intruders on this crime scene. WB distracts AR while PM follows Jade's instructions to complete the delivery. The package arrives in the past where it causes young Jade to first meet John, Rose, and Dave. This is Homestuck's least contrived time travel plot. John has defeated his boss monsters earning a bounty of grist. Snagging a big piece necessitates jumping into his father's room, which he finds filled not with harlequins, but the artifacts of a comically stoic businessman. John spies some birthday presents, which allow him to look snazzy and finally make his fetch modus usable. With this swag, John alchemizes more swag, a lot of swag. John's room has also been vandalized by imps, or so he thinks, until Rose tells him that the vandalism has been present since she first connected to his spur client. She believes John subconsciously drew the graffiti to express a repressed memory. Meanwhile, Dave is done getting beaten up, but he snapped his sword and dismembered Cal in the process. Bro gives Dave his betas, which he installs, connecting to Rose. Rose prototypes Jasper's and does a sick catch to smash the bottle from a pre-punched card, transporting her house into the game. In a thrilling final sequence, John fights his way through his house, up to the first gate and onto the planet below, ending Act 3 and beginning the first intermission. I hope you individuals are ready, because this is my favorite part of Homestuck. Homestuck's first intermission is largely inscrutable and a bit of a waste of time, but it's a fun ride. Because of this, there's no point recapping the whole thing, but here are some of the highlights. Throughout Homestuck, we've seen glimpses of the previously unimportant Midnight Grew comic, which takes Homestuck's place on the in-universe MS Paint Adventures website. Spade Slick, who looks suspiciously like Arch Agent Jack Nor, is the leader of the Midnight Night Crew, a playing card themed gang. Spades and crew are mid infiltration of a rival gang, the Felts Mansion. They're themed around pool, and each member has a different time travel power. The Felts' mysterious leader, Lord English, is secretly Homestuck's final boss, but that won't matter for thousands of pages. The intermission embraces staples of Andrew Hussey's earlier work, Problem Sleuth, particularly in the doubling of items. The text of the comic will refer to an item that will then become something totally different. Notably, there's Spades Slick's rules card for Blackjack, which doubles the Spades' key that he doesn't know the purpose of. The intermission consists of the Midnight Crew offing different members of the Felt, often multiple times because of time travel shenanigans. There's also a surprising helping of jokes about pleasuring oneself. My favorite offing from each member of the Midnight Crew are Spade Slick's triple beheading of Crowbar and two Sawbucks, Diamond Droop's riddling fin full of holes, Club's Deuce's accidental exploding of Doze and Trace, and Heart Spot's car's biting Eggs' head right off. The most important thing that happens is Spade Slick traveling to a different timeline where he gets partially blinded by Snowman. Her special power is that if she perishes, she takes the entire universe down with her. By the end of the intermission, Spade Slick has used a crowbar that breaks temporal artifacts to get into the Felt's vault. This transports him to a timeline where everybody but Snowman has perished. In the vault, Spades miraculously finds a use for his key, but not before Snowman rips his arm off. Behind the door is a console, connecting spades to an alien kid that he recognizes and ending the intermission. This whole thing is more than a bit silly, but that's what makes it so fun. All you really need to remember is that the felt exists and is led by Lord English, plus spades talking to that alien kid at the end. We now return to form with Act 4. Act 4 opens with a playable flash game. The game is awesome, but not all that fun, though it does give you an authentically frustrating silly dice experience. Beneath John's house is a planet, the land of wind and shade, populated by exposition-loving consorts who call John the heir of breath. The trolls are major characters from here on out. Carcinogeneticist, who's that alien kid from the intermission, tells John that they're friends in the future. CG's been trolling John backwards in time because he's a dumbass, much to his frustration and John's Amusement. The trolls won their own game of Spur, but it went wrong for unknown reasons that they blame the kids for. They now hide in the Veil, a belt of
Speaking of Rose, she's arrived in the land of light and rain and her mother's taken off. Jasper's sprite fills Rose in on the lore of her planet. She's the seer of light and must wake up to fulfill her destiny. Jade suggests this is meant literally and tells Rose about dream selves, which are supposed to wake up on Dursa Prospect when a spur player goes to sleep. Jade's still in the Frog Temple, where the time capsule resets to open in 413 years. Zack, the god dog, catches her and teleports her back to her room. With the new betas, Jade connects to Dave and prototypes a sprite with the crow he skewered earlier. Dave's pre-punched card makes a big egg, which his sprite confiscates. The sprite nests until it's too late, but Dave is bailed out by his bro, who slices the impending meteor in half, giving the egg time to hatch and sending Dave into the medium and the land of heat and clockwork. John's been speaking to another troll, Gallows Calibrator. She wants to mess with the timeline to prove to the other trolls that it can be done, and John accepts her help because he's a dumbass. GC tells him that he can defeat his planet's final boss, the Denizen, while it's still asleep and jump way ahead in the game. With her help, John fixes the inoperable rocket pack he made earlier and takes off to the seventh gate above his house to defeat his Denizen. Oh no, John's dead. Dave and Rose have spent four months in a doom timeline. They've been hanging out and slaying monsters, planning to send Dave back in time to fix things. As he does, future Rose goes to sleep to try to preserve her consciousness and her dream self. Future Dave prototypes himself and gets past Dave to save John. John goes through a different gate and lands on Rose's planet, Lolar. She's asleep, so John snoops through her stuff, finding his birthday present, which is a resuscitated family heirloom that looks suspiciously like a bunny he's already been gifted today. Rose's dream self, now awake, bonks Dave with some yarn and wakes him up too. Rose wakes up and alchemizes some swag, which she puts to work. Dave wakes up and alchemizes his own swag, including Rose's journals, which he tricked John into showing him the capture code for earlier. They and his betas are stolen by the draconian dignitary, who's working for Jack Nor. Dee Dee takes these things to the frog temple in the veil, where he discards the betas into the time capsule for Jade to find years later. Remember when Jasper's told Rose a secret and then disappeared? Turns out it was a genetic code that she's been scrawling on her walls and in her journal. Dee Dee uses the stolen code to create McQuarrel and sends him to Earth on a meteor where he'll eventually become Jade's guardian. Just as Rose wakes up, John flies off, discovering a transportalizer in the veil. With the machine, John creates paradox clones of each of the kids and their guardians, sending them back in time. Yeah, that's right, none of the Homestuck characters are organic. They were all made in the lab and sent to Earth on meteors, like a time-traveling Superman. This matters a little bit, but not nearly as much as it seems like it ought to. Act 4 pretends to end with an extended Con Air tribute, but turns out it's a psych and there's more act to cover. Before Act 4 ends, let's catch up with our monochrome friends. The aimless renegade surrenders after seeing Beck's profile carved into WV's pumpkin. They all become friends and build an even bigger town with AR's militia. Then a huge egg appears. The windswept questant pops out. They recognize her as the White Queen and fashion her a crown, which she gives to PM. Turns out WV has had the Queen's ring this entire time, though we don't yet know how he got it. We also meet each exile before they were exiled in the time concurrent with the players. AR, an authority regulator, confiscates John's birthday present in Beta from his dad's car. He's interrupted by PM, a parcel mistress who's following Jade's instructions. She's only able to get the Beta though, which she drops into a parcel pexus. On Durst, PM negotiates a deal with Jack Nor to get the present. She must kill the White King and Queen. Jack uses the present to regicide the Black Queen and becomes empowered by her ring. He goes to the battlefield where he slaughters an uprising being led by WV, a war wary Boleyn. Jack kills the Black King and unleashes these tentacly things called the Red Miles, starting the reckoning. This causes meteors of the Veil to crash into Skya, although the planet buys time by redirecting them toward Earth. The Miles destroy Prospect and Jade sacrifices her dream self to save John's, exploding her robot and her room. Trusting in Jade's plan, both White Monarchs willingly give PM their crowns, which she exchanges for the present. Along the way, the King's Scepter is lost and the Queen's Ring falls into Jade's possession and then John's when her dream self dies. Finally opening his birthday present, John finds letters from Jade and her pen pal. The payoff on this pen pal won't come for thousands of pages. The gift itself is a robotic bunny, which saves John's life when Jack finds him. Act 4 ends with Rose signing off her game FAQ with her intent to tear Spurp apart, and now it's troll time. The Hypen arc introduces us to 12 trolls who play the same game as the Homestuck kids. Hailing from the planet Alternia, trolls are an alien species with gray skin and horns. Adult trolls busy themselves with intergalactic conquests, so the Alternian population is almost entirely youngsters. Troll children are birthed from the Mother Grub and undergo a series of trials to prove their worth to Alusus, a monstrous creature that serves as the troll's lifelong guardian. Trolls can form to a blood-based class system called the Hemocast. Red blood bad, pink blood good. The first troll we meet is my crabby little meow meow Carcat Bantus. Carcat's a mutant freak with candy red blood who would have been cold in his infancy if not for the care of his lusses. His interests surprisingly align with John's. Both kids' programming skills are just as bad as their taste in movies. Carcat chats with his best friend Gamzy Makara, whose purple blood places him in the highest caste of landoline trolls. Gamzy follows a clown cult and has spoiled his brain with soporific slime. Gamzy's been recruited to play a game called Escrub with some friends. They've organized themselves into red and blue teams, and Carcat's pissed to have not heard about this sooner. You'll quickly learn that Carcat's always pissed about something, but that's part of his charm. Carcat badgers red team leader Terezi Pyrope until she lets him take over. Terezi is blind but was taught by her lusses to see through taste and smell. Licking things is a big part of her personality. She's the troll who got John killed earlier, or will get him killed later from her perspective. Terezi fancies herself a lawyer executioner, and we're introduced to her as she roleplays the prosecution of a corrupt senator. With the flip of a coin, she sentences him to the gallows. Terezi connects to Carcat as his escrub server player. Because he's a dumbass, Carcat runs a computer program that explodes his computer and places a curse on him and everyone that'll ever meet for all of eternity. This kills all of the twelve trolls less eye. Carcat prototypes his dead lusses and arrives in the land of Pulse and Haze as the Knight of Blood. We aren't given too much detail on the minutiae of the Trolls escrub game, more so the high vent arc starts to introduce each troll and their evolving relationships, so focus on the characters. Time to meet three players on the blue team. Solix Captor is a mustard-blooded hacker with a penchant for bifurcation. He's constantly of two minds and they're competing to see which can hate the other more. He possesses psionic abilities, which are common among the trolls of the lower cast, but his are especially potent. Solix created the red and blue teams to maximize chances of success at the game, which he believes will save the world. He developed escrub from technology scavenged from ruins by his former love interest, Aradi Megiddo. A
our emotions. Three different trolls have attempted to install themselves as co-leader of the blue team with Aradia, but she doesn't really care about leadership or much of anything. Aradia lets slip that Esgrub won't save the world, and Solix tries to back out of the game entirely. To prevent him from pulling the plug, Aradia psychically puts Solix to sleep, where he remains until every other troll has entered the game. In the game, in the land of Quartz and Melody, Aradia prototypes herself, and we're hit with a less than shocking realization that she's been a ghost all along. This is massively confusing to Aradia's server player, Nepeta Leon. Nepeta's a cat girl and an avid shipper of her friends. She never has too much importance in the story, but she's a great vehicle to explain troll romance. Troll romance is split into four quadrants, which can each be grouped differently. Red romance is rooted in positive emotion, while black romance is rooted in negative. Concupiscent romance is about the troll reproductive cycle, while conciliatory relationships are platonic. The flesh quadrant is most similar to human romance. Individuals who share this quadrant are called mates The polygamous quadrant is its hateful equivalent. Trolls in this quadrant are called kismessies, basically arch enemies. A good example of kismessies in pop culture would be Tom and Jerry. Their relationship isn't traditionally reproductive, but if it helps to imagine such a scenario, a quick Google search will turn up many elucidating images. Trolls in flushed or polygamous relationships are called upon to fill a bucket with their combined genetic material, which is mixed in the mother grub to produce new trolls. On the conciliatory side, trolls in the pale quadrant are called moirails. These are platonic soulmates who balance each other out socially. Think Sam Puckett and Carly Shay. The Ashen Quadrant describes a three-way relationship where one troll mediates a conflict between two others. Think of me in 2008 during my parents' divorce. Don't get too hung up on the vocab here. All you really need to know is that troll romance is different from human romance and comes in four flavors. Let's bounce back to the red team and meet the rest of their players. Tavros Nitrim is a bullhorn paraplegic who's been recruited to the red team as Gamsey's server player. His trollian handle has a Spanish word in it, which has never made sense to me because Spanish doesn't exist yet. Tavros has a psychic ability to commune with animals, and he fancies himself a sort of Alternian Pokemon trainer. He receives a message from Vriska Circuit, who gloats about being on the blue team. Vriska is a literal blue blood with a psychic ability to control others. She's a passionate player of extreme role-playing games, which she uses to harvest food for her lusses, lest she be devoured herself. She's also directly responsible for Tavros's paralysis, Aradia's ghostliness, and Terezi's blindness. While extreme role-playing with Tavros, Vriska psychically walked him off a cliff. In retaliation, Aradia summoned the spirits of Vriska's spider food, so Vriska vaporized her with a mind-controlled Sullux. In retaliation to this, Terezi manipulated a friend of Vriska's into blowing her face up. This friend types in white text and is a mysterious villain called Doc Scratch, who we'll learn much more about later. Vriska's final act of retaliation was to mind control Tavros to commune with Terezi's lusses to mind control Terezi to make her look into the blinding Alternian sun. The two made a truce to avoid mutually assured destruction and haven't played a game together since. They both end up on the red team though when Aradia double crosses Vriska and kicks her from the blue team. She becomes Tavros' server player and constructs a quest of her own for him. Once in the game, she directs him to her house in the land of maps and treasures where she kisses him because she's a bit of a psychopath but also a confused teenager. Tavros does not reciprocate her feelings. Watching this go down as Vriska's server player, Kanaya Merriam, the final member of the red team. Kanaya specifically requested to be Vriska's server player because she views her as her Moirail and a potential mate split, but that idea gets defenestrated when she kisses Tavros. Kanaya is a special troll who can withstand Alternia's sunlight and has a passion for vampire literature. Interestingly, she's also been reading Rose's game FAQ, though she assumes it was written by a long gone member of an alien species. Kanaya's Lusses, a virgin mother grub, passes of natural causes just before the game starts. Kanaya retrieves an egg, called a matriorb, from its abdomen, and locks it away in her chastity fetch modus where it will stay until she finds a key at the right moment. In time, the matriorb will hatch a new mother grub, essential to the propagation of the troll species. The whole red team's basically in the game at this point, so let's wrap up introducing the blue team. Next door to Vriska lives fellow blue blood Equius Zahak. Equius is debilitatingly strong to the point that he snaps every bow he tries to fire and his touch bruises his lusses. He's also Moira's with Nepeta, but he's kind of gross and controlling about it. He's a hardcore blood racist, has a borderline kinky relationship with Gamzee, and likes to build and destroy robots. When Equius arrives in the game, he delivers a robot body to Aradia, which he's programmed to be in love with him because he's kind of gross and controlling. This produces conflicting emotions for Aradia. The last two blue team members are Aridin Ampora and Feferi Pyxes. Aridin is introduced blasting a whale with a laser rifle. This is the last cool thing he does. In fact, it's the last not awful thing he does. Feferi Fairy feeds the whale to her lovecrafty and horror terror of a Lussus. Much like Briska, Feferi must keep her Lussus fed, not because it will eat her, but because its voice is a psychic shockwave lethal to all of troll kind. Aridin and Feferi are aquatic trolls and sit atop the Hemo spectrum. In fact, Feferi's at the very tip top, with the royalist blood possible, and is heir to the Alternian throne. They have contrasting visions for Alternian society, with Aridin dreaming of genociding all land dwellers and Feferi yearning to dismantle the caste system altogether. This makes them great Moirails, that is, until they get in the game and there's no one left to genocide and Feferi calls off their relationship. Aridin takes this as an opportunity to express his romantic feelings for Feferi which she does not reciprocate. And whoa, what's this? The teams didn't matter at all. These two sessions become one big one as Karkat brings Solix into the game to try to save his life. He doesn't succeed, though. Solix perishes from Feferi's Lusses' aforementioned psychic shockwave, but Feferi navigates to his house and plants a kiss on his lips. This awakens his dream self, which effectively functions as an extra life. Solix, the lucky duck, gets an extra extra life. With both teams in one 12-person session, Karkat assumes leadership of the whole squad. The trolls win their game of Escrub by conspiring with their version of Jack in order to exile the Black Queen, and then double-crossing Jack and exiling him, too. This leaves just one final boss, the Black King. The trolls face him with an army of Aradia bots from doomed timelines and only succeed with a lucky roll of Vriska's dice. Just as the trolls celebrate their triumph, a rift opens in paradox space. We don't quite learn what this means yet, but the trolls blame the human kids for not being able to claim their reward. And what is that reward? Turns out the point of the game is to create a new universe, and the trolls are the daddies of Earth and all of humanity. As the trolls hide from an unknown monster in their session's veil, we return to the human kids with the rest of Act 5. Act Part 2 starts at the chronological end of Act 5 because nothing in Homestuck is simple. Clarkat talks to John for the first time from his perspective, which is John's last conversation with him. Clarkat confesses to having romantic feelings for John. John is not a homosexual. When last we saw 
Rajon, he just created himself, his friends, and their guardians out of goo and sent them to Earth on meteors. The meteor he's on is crashing too, but he's saved by a Dursite Authority Regulator who falls to Earth and becomes the Aimless Renegade. Remember when the Parcel Mistress dropped John's Spurb server copy into a Parcel Pyxis earlier? It catches up to him. Meanwhile, Rose has established contact with the Horror Terrors of the Furthest Ring, endowing her with magical powers that she uses to tear Spurb apart. She's learning about something called the Green Sun. She's been exchanging information with Kanaya. The other trolls pop up here and there. The biggest players are Riska and Terezi, who respectively troll John and Dave to stoke their own rivalry. Aridin comes onto Rose and she explodes his computer. Dave shows Gamzee the insane clown posse and it breaks his brain. Equius raps at Dave about muscular horses and says, Connect blows to discover how invincible Peck's servant are low to uncover his inimitable nectar. Remember how Jade's falling from her room after her dream robot blew up? Beck catches her. She finally becomes friends with Carcat after he fights with his future self in a memo. By the way, Trollian can create memos that anyone can join from the past, present, or future. With John connected as her server player, Jade prepares to enter the game. Simultaneously, Dave's sprite and bro face Jack Nor, who sets John's planet on fire. Just as John's about to prototype Jade's kernel sprite, Friska puts him to sleep. She wants to be responsible for Jack becoming an invincible monster because she believes she'll be the one to kill him. With John asleep, Jade struggles to break the pinata that will send her into the game. There isn't enough time until Beck prototypes himself and hits the meteor with a psi blast that levels the whole world. Jade snipes the pinata and arrives in the land of frost and frogs. Don't forget, Jack has mid-fight with Dave's sprite and bro and receives Beck's god powers from the prototyping. The fight takes a turn for the worst as a sea of flaming oil threatens to consume John. John has instances from immolation. On ruined earth, WB urges him from a command console to do the windy thing. The windy thing puts out the fire. Riska instructs John to ascend to god tier, the highest point a player can reach in the game. God tier awards conditional immortality, a death is only permanent if it's heroic or just. Riska achieved god tier in the troll session after Aradia beat her to the brink of death. To reach god tier, a player must die on their quest bed. Riska doesn't tell John this though, not until after Jack has stabbed him. John is reborn as a god tier heir of breath on the battlefield. Heir of breath is John's title within the game. Each of the kids in trolls has one. It's a combination of a class and an aspect. Classpect. I'm currently wearing my aspect of breath hoodie from middle school. John befriends WV, who now has the queen's ring, and finds his dad's wallet, which contains a car that they fly around with John's new wind powers. Also on the battlefield is Jack Nor, who's murdered John's dad and Rose's mother. He's inherited Beck's love of Jade though and can't hurt her himself, so he instructs the courtyard droll to assassinate her. Dave has been pestering Terezi about God Tier. She tells him that he won't reach it and uses some time shenanigans to prove it. Having entered the game, Jade bounces around the medium in a superpowered brawl with an imp, which Beck's sprite vaporizes. She prototypes her taxidermy dream self, which her grandpa has stored in her attic. She's been dead for a long time though, and she starts blubbering when Jade requests she go fight Jack Nor. While in the attic, Karkat instructs Jade to turn off a finistrated wall that creeps him out. This is Olmstuck's metafictional fourth wall, and on the other side is Andrew Hussey's self-insert. With help from Karkat and Kanaya, Jade begins to breed frogs, which is how the game's ultimate goal of creating a new universe is achieved. The goal is to create a frog, called Billy a Slick, that will contain the new universe. Remember Doc Scratch, the villain from the Trolls universe who blew Friska's face up? He's been talking to Rose. Scratch works for Lord English, Homestuck's secret final boss, and wants to die to bring him into existence. With his help, Rose has formulated a two-part plan involving the Green Sun and a game mechanic called the Scratch. Apparently, Doc Scratch and Bequerel are the same type of creature called First Guardians and draw their power from the Green Sun. At Rose's direction, John retrieves a bomb called the Tumber from the battlefield, which she hopes to use to blow up the Green Sun, depowering Jack. The other part of her plan, the Scratch, is built into the game to reset a universe that won't produce a successful session. This will effectively kill the kids as we know them, creating an entirely new universe where they live different lives. Rose has found a white cue ball planted in the human's universe by Doc Scratch, which works like a magic eight ball that always gives accurate predictions. Learning about her mother's death, Rose asks the cue ball if she can trust the horror terrors and accepts their power, turning grimdark. She flies off to fight Jack with John on the battlefield. Jack makes short work of John and begins the duel rose. We catch up with the trolls in a series of flash games. They're still hiding out in a meteor in the veil after Beck Nor inexplicably enter their session just as they were about to claim their prize. While waiting around, Kanaya and Equius equip Tavros with some robo legs. Carcat passes out at the sight of blood, finally awakening as his dream self, just in time for Jack to destroy Prospect. Terezi received a transfer of 413 boon bonds, a fortune in the Spurb in game currency. This transfer came from Dave in the future and directs the trolls to contact the kids for the first time. We later learn that Terezi is responsible for Dave sending this money in the first place. Meanwhile, Feferi has been working with the horror tears of the furthest ring to set up dream bubbles for her teammates whose dream selves have died. The dream bubbles really come out of left field and didn't make any sense to me the first time that I read Homestuck. In summary, they're a place where living players go while asleep if their dream selves are dead, as well as a permanent resting place for any dead players, including those from alternate timelines. Jack moves on to destroy Durst, set to Toby Fox's Megalovania, which sounds like this. Do 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 At the heart of the kingdom is Aradia's dream self, which never awoke because she entered the game as a ghost. She slumbers on her quest bed and ascends to God tier amidst the moon's destruction to freeze Jack in time. Aradia is properly alive again. She holds Jack here for a while, buying time, before jumping through him to reach the green sun. Meanwhile, Riska's plotting to fly off and fight Jack. Tavros tries to stop her and she kills him. Terezi finds his body and decides it's finally time to bring Friska down. Aridin has become obsessed with science magic and duels Solex, blinding him, and kills Feferi and Kanaya. He also smashes the Matriorb, dooming trolls to extinction. Karkat, already gobsmacked by Aridin's rampage, receives a worrying message from Gamzee. Gams has run out of slime pies and his brain is defaulting to the murderous state of purple blooded trolls. Karkat recruits Equius to stop Gamzee, but he gets himself and Nepeta killed. A showdown between Friska, Aridin, and Gamzee is interrupted by Kanaya, who's been reborn as a troll vampire called a Rainbow Drinker. She honks Gamzee, clocks Friska, and chainsaws Aridin. Friska absconds to the rooftop where she messages John goodbye. She's still planning to go fight Jack, but Terezi confronts her. We're left with a cliffhanger as Terezi flips her coin to determine whether she'll let Riska go. Because of some nonsense, the metafictional disc on which Homestuck is metafictionally played gets metafictionally scratched. We, the Homestuck reader,
animation, image clippings, and a banner at the top of the screen. Rose is still fighting Jack, but it's a losing battle. As Jack flies off, John resurrects with his new god tier immortality. He kisses Rose to revive her as her dream self and flies off with her needles to go enact the scratch. Our other cliffhanger, Teresi's coin flip, ends with her letting Briska go. But Teresi uses her seer of mind powers to look into the future, seeing that she and Karkat will die even if Briska beats Jack. She kills Riska and it's a just death. Dave's been helping Jade breed frogs, but Jack attacks. Jade smooches Dave alive and finds that Jack won't hurt her. This puts Dave and Rose alive as their dream selves on Durst. This is perfect because their plan to destroy the green sun involves getting there on Durst's moon. John sent WB and his robotic bunny, which he's named Liv Tyler, to Durst with a tumor that he extracted from the battlefield. Jack blows up their ship, sending WB to Earth and dropping Liv on Durst, where she gives Rose the tumor. While all this is going down, Doc Scratch is sending to another house guest, Spade Slick, from the intermission. Spades is the troll's version of Jack Nor after being exiled to their ruined planet. He makes out with Snowman, who's the troll's exiled black queen, because they're Kismessies. Doc Scratch beats Spades up because he wants him to kill Snowman. Remember that her life is tied to the fate of the troll's universe. Amidst this conflict, the pages of Doc Scratch's scrapbook get spilled and we see snapshots from all over the place. Dave Sprite consoles Jade Sprite on the battlefield. In a dream bubble, Dead Briska goes on a date with the alternate timeline John that Terezi got killed. Gamzee hits on Tavros. At the Green Sun, Aradia awaits the arrival of Dave and Rose with Sullux, who's simultaneously back on the meteor because he's half dead, half alive. Dave and Rose meet in a dream bubble. Dave's asleep, but Rose physically floats through the bubble and nurses severed moon. Rose knocked Dave out with a ball of yarn and commandeered the moon to make the suicide mission to the Green Sun alone. But the draconian dignitary attacks and Dave wakes up and rushes to help. Clarka confesses in a memo that he rushed the troll's frog breeding and worries that he gave their universe cancer in the form of Jack Nor. From the troll session, we see Jack attack the kids' universe with the red miles. Concurrently, Doc Scratch tends to a troll girl that he has locked up. This is the handmaiden, Aradia's ancestor. Ancestors are a mythological concept in troll society where one troll contributes heavily to a new troll's genetics who is destined to follow in their footsteps. Doc Scratch tells the handmaiden about an older universe of trolls where they failed their escrub session and had to scratch themselves. In their reset universe, Doc Scratch drove the troll people to become more violent. He's raising the handmaiden to serve Lord English, though eventually she will relinquish her duties to her imperious condescension. This is Fafari's ancestor, the Alternian Empress, and the last surviving adult troll. Creeping across the comic's top banner is Andrew Hussey's self-insert, who kills Doc Scratch with a broom. Hussey retrieves the metafictional disc, and we're back to Homestuck as normal. On the meteor, Karkat calms Gamzee's rage with a shush pap, and they become Moirails. In the final moments before John begins the scratch, Jade is exploded by a Barbasol bomb and drops her frog into lava. We begin one of Homestuck's most iconic flash animations, with Jade dead, John beginning the scratch, and Rose and Dave mid-suicide mission. S Cascade is lauded as one of the comic's best moments as a single 14-minute flash animation wraps up nearly every loose thread in Homestuck's fifth act. A horde of monsters descends on John mid-scratch. Jack carries the exploded Jade to her quest bed and flies off to the time capsule in the Frog Temple. On Earth, the White King and Queen are briefly reunited as the time capsule opens, but Jack is released right after. He kills the monarchs and AR and wounds WB to power a transportalizer to the troll's session where he does all the stuff we've already seen him do. PM dons the ring that WB has been carrying for so long and chases after Jack. On Durst's moon, Dave has slain the draconian dignitary. Rose and Dave descend to the moon's interior with bomb in hand where they're surprised to find their quest slabs. The tumor sheds its exterior to reveal red and blue capsules representing the trolls and humans' universes. Spade Slick shoots Snowman, ending the troll's universe just as the bomb goes off. But what? Dave and Rose arrive to find that the green sun isn't there. The tumor creates the green sun, and Dave and Rose ascend to god tier. With a big green target to aim for, Sulux racks his psionic power to fling the meteor toward the sun. On her quest bed, Jade rises up, merging with her dream self to reach dog tier. She inherits Beck's god powers and develops Witch of Space powers, saving the battle hill from an impending meteor. She shrinks the entire session down to the palm of her hand, snagging John along the way. The final moment of Act 5 is Jade smashing through the fourth wall from her attic as the scratch resets the old universe behind her. We go straight into the second intermission, which is a brief and ominous flash as Lord English grows out of Dog Scratch's mangled body. English travels back in time to set into motion the events that led to his summoning in the first place. With a glimpse of a new Earth and a new protagonist, we begin Act 6. Act 6, Act 1 introduces us to Jane Crocker and the three friends that she'll be playing Spurb with. Jane is a 15 and a half year old version of John's Nana, the beta kids and their guardians have swapped places in this universe. She's an amateur gumshoe, a prank enthusiast, and heiress to the Betty Crocker Corporation. We see her room and the two bunnies that she was gifted on her 13th birthday by friends Jake and Roxy. Jane alludes to a third unseen bunny from her friend Dirk that is definitely a robot. We also meet the kid version of Jade's grandpa, Jake English. Jake's an indiscriminate lover of cinema and adventure. Jane's got a crush on him, which can't be incest, but I don't know how it's not. Actually, the whole friend group has a crush on Jake. Jane messages Jake about a dream she had where she awoke on Prospect to find a funeral for the Page of Hope. Turns out this page is Jake and his dream self has been assassinated. Neither kid had awoken on Prospect before, so they don't fully understand this, but they take it as a grim omen. Just like Jade, Jake lives on an island with a frog temple. Unlike Jade, his island is populated by Lusai. Jake is Jade's mysterious pen pal, and today's the day that he sends her the robotic bunny, but to power the machine that will send it, he needs a chunk of uranium. He messages Dirk for help, but gets his autoresponder. This AR, not to be confused with the dead Dirk site, is a replica of Dirk's consciousness stored in his glasses. AR tells Jake he can get the uranium from the sparring robot Dirk built him. He's just gotta beat it first. The robot saves Jake from a sea goat, and a strife is afoot. Checking back in with Jane, today is the launch of the Betty Crocker rebrand, as well as the Spurb Alpha. The new logo is reminiscent of her Imperious Condescension, who secretly runs Crocker Corp, but Jane doesn't know this. Her friend Roxy hints at it, though. She believes the Condes, or the Batter Witch as she calls her, wants them to play Spurb as part of some grand plan. Roxy was able to hack the Spurb files off a Crocker Corp server, and it was easy. Too easy. She offers to send them to Jane, but the mail's just arrived, and Jane decides to get her physical copies. The problem is, her dad has forbidden her from leaving the house after a string of assassination attempts. She's literally homestuck. She gets Dirk's robotic bunny, which she's named Little Sebastian, to move the fridge. This alerts her dad, so she scampers to the mail,
three years. Thankfully, they have the inhabitants of their entire session to keep them company. Preparing for their own three-year journey, Rose and Dave get acquainted with Karkat, Terezi, Kanai, and Gamzi. Aradia and Sulux are there too, but they're staying behind to take care of the dream bubbles. Kanai considers staying, but Aradia convinces her she still might be able to repopulate the troll species. Plus, Rose asks her nicely to come. Aradia tries to throw a funeral, and Karkat yells at everyone a lot. While no one is looking, Gamzi retreats into the media with all the trolls' corpses. It's a lot of fun seeing everybody interact like this. This is the first time Homestuck characters have actually properly spoken to each other in person. They are interrupted by the arrival of WB, who will join them on their journey. Rose uses her new seer of light powers to chart a course of the furthest ring to the Alpha Kid session. Aradia and Sulux provide a psychic send-off to the meteor's journey. Jack follows the meteor, followed by PM, and a three-year chase is afoot. With Jade's green sun powers, John's able to send a note to the meteor, but he sends it in a bucket, which is salacious in troll culture. Jane watches premonitions of the future in the Alpha Kid sky as we return to Act 6. Since getting blown up at the end of Act 6, Act 1, Jane's been awake on Prospect, where she's murdered by Jack Nor. The agents are being so murdery because Durst is under new management by her imperious condescension. Jack blows up Jane's whole dream tower, but her dream self resurrects because of her powers as the maid of life. Real life Jane survived the mailbox explosion. This is thanks to a creature she and her friends call God Cat, who's apparently always messing with them. G Cat is a first guardian with the same abilities as Bequerel and Dog Scratch, but is being mind controlled by the Condess. Not a fan of its nose or its green tongue. Jane tells her BFFFC Roxy about how she just got blown up and stabbed. Roxy the Lawn is a wizard obsessed hacker with a drinking problem. Besides my crabby Meow Meow, Roxy's probably my favorite Homestuck character. I like her funny typos. Her house is lousy with mutant cats and fenestrated walls. These walls are just like the one John and Jade are traveling through right now and create shortcuts across the furthest ring. Roxy and Dirk live 413 years in the future on a post apocalyptic Earth. Jane has never believed this, but is convinced by her recent near death experiences to be more open minded. Roxy still feels the need to prove it, though, and appears purifies Jane's copy of Colonel Sassaker's daunting text. But G-Cat's interference drops the book on Roxy's cat. This is Jasper's, who Roxy accidentally appearified while Rose was a kid. She defenestrates herself into her house's lab, telling Jane not to place Burb without her. Roxy sends Jasper's body back to Rose, but when she tries to return home, G-Cat teleports her plane to Dirk's house, where it's unplugged. A troll who's aesthetically reminiscent of Feferi attacks, and Roxy absconds back to the lab, which is full of carapations. Jane goes ahead and runs the files that Roxy sent her, but they explode her computer. Roxy set this up to dissuade Jane from playing Spurb. Remember that she thinks this is part of the Batter Witch's plan. Jane instead connects with Dirk as her server player. Dirk Strider is a puppet fetishizing roboticist. Because he's a total tryhard, Dirk is constantly awake as his dream self, and he watches Roxy sleepwalk off into the furthest ring. A hegemonic brute attempts an assassination. While Dirk challenges the Dursite Arc agents, Jake is getting beaten up by Brobot. Jake passes out and goes to the dream bubbles, remember that his dream self is dead, where he sees a new troll aesthetically reminiscent of Riska. He's love-struck because she fulfills two of his niche fetishes. Bad news for everybody else. Jake tells Roxy about the blue girl, who says that he's got to message Jane right now before her feelings get hurt. Jane panics and denies having any feelings for Jake, who then asks for help on Dirk's courtship, and she accidentally gives him some really good advice. Despondent, Jane decides to go ahead and enter her session, but G-Cat prevents her from prototyping anything. Jane watches her Imperious condescension ship arrive on Earth just as her house disappears. We skip forward in time to what Dirk and Roxy consider to be the present day. Dirk faces Crockerbots in an oceanic landscape, and Roxy lives in a hyper-urban chess grid. This reveal is the last note of Act 6, Act 2. Act 6's second intermission opens with Andrew Hussey's self-insert. Hussey has rebuilt Spade Slick from the first intermission into a robot. Hussey's trad wife, Miss Paint, runs into Lord English, who executes Hussey. Hussey's ghost goes to a dream bubble, where they propose to Friska. One year into the kids' voyage to the new session, Karkat argues with himself in a memo. Terezi and David become good friends while helping WB to rebuild Can Town, and Karkat feels alienated. Rose and Kanaya have been researching the future. They have foreknowledge of the Alpha Kid session, specifically that they'll fail to prototype any of their sprites before entering the game. This results in a null session where they won't be able to breed a godfrog, but the beta kids are bringing their whole session with them, including their godfrog. Karkat and Dave fight about troll romance as the meteor enters a dream bubble. A year into their own journey, John and Jade are playing a Ghostbusters MMO. They haven't visited many dream bubbles, so they haven't had much contact with the meteor crew. When John gets knocked out, he follows Roxy's sleepwalking dream self through a dream bubble. There, they see the fairy looking troll. This is Mina Pikesies, and the troll that Jake saw earlier is a running circuit. They're from the session of trolls that scratch to create Alternia. Mina's hunting Roxy, but John jumps in the way of her trident. Rania meets Terezi and they join up with the rest of the meteor crew. This meeting takes place in the next act. The Alpha Kids have been talking to an alien heavily implied to be a troll. This isn't a troll, but a cherub named Calliope. Calliope is a homestuck fangirl who shares a body with her evil brother Calibor. The siblings are introduced via a chess match. Calliope is one every game they've ever played, but Calibor tricks her into forfeiting by disguising as king and queen. We'll catch up with the cherubs at the end of Act 6, Act 3. The Alpha Kids Jack Nor was caught by the White Queen after trying to kill Jane for the second time. He's incarcerated and served his dinner, which the courtyard droll is used to smuggle him knives. Jack kills a bunch of prospecting guys, but doesn't escape. In Jack's absence, the Draconian Dignitary has been hunting Dirk. He uses the Black Queen's unprototyped ring to unleash the Red Miles. Meanwhile, Jane has arrived in the land of Crips and Helium, which is strangely devoid of underlings and consorts. Gamzee is here? He's got Aradia's time machine, so we can blame time travel. He's also maybe ascended to God tier, but it's probably just a costume, considering he doesn't have wings. Gamzee volunteers to be Jane's guide and tries to sell her vials of troll blood. Jane turns him down, so Gamzee prototypes Tavros and Briska's bodies. Tavros Sprite explodes, causing Tavros and Briska to meet in a dream bubble. Speaking of dream bubbles, an earthquake has knocked Jake out and sent him into one. He relives a conversation where Dirk reveals that he and Rock Roxy live in the year 2422. Her Imperious condescension has made Earth uninhabitable, and Dirk and Roxy are the last two humans. Jake realizes that he's dreaming, but talks to the splinter version of Dirk he's created until Arania interrupts them. She info dumps on Jake and then reveals that she can read his mind and knows he's super horny for her. She tells Jake he's destined to defeat Lord English and brings him to meet the rest of the Meteor kids. When Arania arrives, the Meteor crew is fighting Mina, who's still trying to
looking for her dad, who's wandered off. She chats with Calliope, who's been trying to get a sperm session going with Caliborn. AR has Jane connect as Roxy's server player, but can't stop her from adventuring through a transportalizer where she arrives on Dirt, seeing Jake and Dirk. Jane gets red miles as little Sebastian flies Jake off to his ruined house on his erupted island. Dirk and Roxy have spent this whole act fighting Crockerbots. Red miles are also on Earth, but these miles are from when Jack Nor attacked the Frog universe with them all the way back in Act 5. Roxy connects as Jake's server player, but she gets Miles too. Dirk gets knocked out and drops Lil' Cal into the ocean. Dream Splinter Dirk becomes real Dirk. He grabs Roxy's dream self and chucks her out of the bubble toward Durst. Rania wakes him up and it's go time. Robot number one handles game entry stuff as Dirk rocket boards through Roxy's fenestrated wall. He smooches Roxy awake as her dream self and uses robot number two to get her house ready to go to the game. Dirk decapitates himself with a syndicator. His head arrives in front of a sleeping Jake as a mysterious bucket of water awakens him. AR tells Jake that he must kiss Dirk's head to activate his dream self. Dirk kisses Jane alive as a dream self on Prospect. He flies into the time capsule with Roxy, emerging into the frog temple where he snags Jane. Dirk scoops a bucket of water to splash on Jake, waking him up where he kisses Dirk's head. All four kids enter at once along with Dirk's robots. Also prepared to enter the game is Caliborn, who's reached premature dominance over Calliope. Caliborn's kernel sprite turns into a black hole and sucks him into a single player session. Burb. Surprise! Caliborn is baby Lord English, more or less. Lord English has been destroying Dream Bubbles, and Mina wants to raise an army of ghosts to go stop him. In three Flash games throughout Act 6 Inter Mission 3, Mina tries to recruit the trolls from her Spurb session. These trolls, called Dancestors, are from the planet before us, which had a caste system based not on hierarchy but beneficience. We've already met Arania Circuit, the exposition loving spider troll. She refuses Mina's invitation because she's been looking for Calliope's dream ghost, hoping that she'll be able to go fight Lord English. Other notable Dancestors are Curlaws and Mulin. They worship Lord English on the down low and made Gamzee's costume. These games culminate in a mini strife between the Alpha and Beta trolls led by Mina and Vriska. On the Meteor, Rose has gotten drunk in anticipation of a date with Kanaya, which has made her late for said date. They kiss in a very cute scene that ends with Rose falling down some stairs. Elsewhere, John celebrates his 15th birthday by watching his favorite movie, Con Air, but he realizes that it sucks. Jade is bummed out too, because Dave Sprite's just broken up with her. John tantrums himself into a nap where he runs into Beck Nor. Jack stabs him, but John discovers a sick new power where he can turn into wind. John sees Rose and puts a silly hat on Jack, who flees. John continues to explore the dream bubble and runs into Tavros, who's dropped the ring that Andrew Hussey used to propose to Vriska last intermission. John pockets the ring just as Tavros wakes up. They squabble as Vriska arrives and fills John in on what she's been up to since dying two years ago. Vriska's hunting a fabled treasure that can be used to defeat Lord English. She's got a bunch of blank maps that are filling in as Lord English destroys dream bubbles. Mina shows up and John gets forked in the mini strife but awakens with the ring. Act 6, Act 4 is a single flash animation that shows us what the Alpha Kids have been up to since entering their session months ago. Their planets are all as desolate as Jane's, a product of their kernel sprites being unprototyped upon entry. Act 6, Intermission 4 follows Caliborn, who's entered a unique single player session of Spur. His entire planet, which is a ruined Earth for reasons that we'll get into later, was sucked into his session with him and his sky is clouded over. Gamzee is here. He's got wings now, but they're revealed to be fake when Caliborn shoots him up. Good thing clowns are hard to kill. At a weird satellite tower, Caliborn talks directly to Andrew Hussey through the narrative. Prompt. Caliborn must explore ruined Earth to collect keys to unlock screens on different satellite towers. This will show him more of Homestuck and eventually allow him to progress to his planet's core. There, he'll meet his denizen, Yada Bayoth, and be offered the choice. This choice is to continue to play the game to the detriment of everyone who will ever live, or to stop and spare them all a great evil. Gamzee vomits up some keys, allowing Caliborn to unlock his first screens. We see the Alpha Kids Jack Nor in jail as we proceed to Act 6, Act 5. Jake's been carrying around a fenestrated wall that his grandma stole from their Spurb session. This is the wall Jade and John are traveling to in their three-year journey. Jake is hiding from Dirk. They've been dating for months, and Jake finds him intense and overbearing. He confides in Aerosol Sprite, Gamzee's unholy fusion of Aridin and Solix's bodies. Jake messages Jane to complain, and he's forgotten about her birthday. He talks her ear off about his relationship, and she flips out. Roxy and Fafetta Sprite try to console Jane, but she runs off. Also, Roxy is sober now. Caliborn messages Jane to call her fat and tells her that her dad's dead. This isn't true. He's on Durst, where the Draconian dignitary is taking good care of him. Also on Durst is Roxy, who's been teleported here by G-Cat and imprisoned by the Condes. Roxy meets Calliope in a super secret dream bubble hidden from Lord English. She warns Roxy that a big fight's coming tomorrow and advises her to ascend to God tier. Rose shows up, and Callie freaks out. A light player is likely to attract Lord English, so she wakes both the Lawns up. The Condes wants Roxy to use her Rogue of Void powers to materialize a new matrix. Orb, but Roxy doesn't know how to do this. To help, she's given Roxy the unprototyped Queen's Ring, which Roxy uses to turn invisible and escape. Dirk is busy with his autoresponder, which has taken the name Lil Hal. Hal wants Dirk to prototype him, and after a lengthy debate, he agrees to. Unfortunately, Gamzee has already prototyped Equius's body, and Dirk says fuck it. Calibor messages Jake and gives him the capture code for his Juju, which is a magic item that can combine with his sister's Juju to do something super magical. Caliborn is giving it away because he's found a better Juju, Lil Cal. Jake gives Jane the Juju code as a birthday present, just as Calliope messages her and gives her own Juju code. The Jujus are lollipops that snap together and entice Jane to lick it. Jane enters trickster mode, which is kind of like being on magic drugs. She blasts off transforming her planet into Act 6, Act 5, Act 1. High on trickster mode, Jane hunts down Jake and confesses that she's in love with him. She kicks him off a cliff and into trickster mode himself. They decide to get married and have so many babies. They fly to Durst and smash a pumpkin over Roxy's head, looping her into their marriage and baby plan too. She takes them to her planet where they grab a feta sprite and break Roxy's sobriety. Roxy kisses Dirk into trickster mode, but he's too cool for it to work. Trickster Dirk tells Jake off for running away and breaks up with him. Aerosol sprite and Arqueous sprite fight over Fafetta sprite and the conflict tears her apart. The tricksters alchemize legendary weapons and some silly Christmas shit. We snap back to Act 6, Act 5, Act 1 as the kids recover from a wicked candy hangover on their quest labs. In double time, the Alpha kids sort their 
their shit out. Dirk and Jane agree they overrated the allure of Jake English, and Jake relays double apologies to Jane and Dirk through Roxy. In his prospect jail cell, Jack Nor receives a gift from Gamzee. He stares into Lil Cow's eyes and is possessed by Lord English. He begins destroying Prospect. Simultaneously, the contest pulls her ship up and begins to blast Durst with her psionic powers. Both planets explode and the kids ascend to God tier. Roxy is the rogue of void, Dirk is the prince of heart, Jake is the page of hope, and Jane is the mate of life. As Jack attacks, Jade appears. The beta kids are here. She teleports Jack super far away. But the contest springs her trap. She uses her commune abilities to turn Jade Grimbark and teleports a mind control computer onto Jane. Jade teleports Dirk super far away in the other direction. Roxy and Jake get thrown in prison as the contest celebrates. Before we can resolve the off the kids chaos, we got another intermission. This intermission has intermissions where we catch up with Calibor. He's completed his quest on Earth and made a deal with his denizen. His session works like pool with 15 planets to knock into a black hole. As he goes, he unlocks members of the felt from the first intermission. Also from the intermission, Spade Slick survived Lord English's attack on Hussey's manor. He snags English's discarded gun and befriends Miss Paint. She gives him a voodoo doll from the first intermission that revives all the felt members. He takes charge of the gang and returns to Doc Scratch's apartment, now inside the green sun. Spade sets the felt Miss Paint and a horse butler into an oven and uses an emergency exit to the Alpha Kids session. Also arriving in the Alpha Kids session is the meteor, which shows no signs of slowing down. Carcat messages Dave about a problem. A pantsless Terezi is asleep in a Fago coma. She's developed a full-blown cosmetitude with Gamzee, ending her relationship with Dave and ending Gamzee's more allegiance with Carcat. Terezi wakes up and her eyes are healed. Gamzee got in her head and she asked Arania to heal her with a god tier powers. Rose isn't doing much better. Inspired by her mother, she's developed a drinking problem. Kanaya finds her sloshed, working to relocate Cantown. Already in the Alpha Kids session, Dave Sprite bids goodbye to John. John's asleep, adventuring in a dream bubble with Friska Tavros and the Dancesters. They're joined by Aradia and Sulux, who's fully blind now since part of him got ripped into aerosol sprite. Lord English has smashed enough bubbles for them to track down the treasure. Arania and Briska have been mind controlling parties of ghosts to use as bait. While they're traveling, Arania info dumps about cherubs. Cherubs are an asocial species that turn into giant snakes to mate. Friska interrupts her story just as she's getting into the intricacies of leprechaun romance. They find the treasure, and along the way, Arania squeezes in one more story about the rings of life and void. The ring of void was given to Roxy by the Condes and has since been lost. Friska realizes that Hussey tried to give her the ring of life, which would have revived her. She blames Tavros for losing it, and he finally stands up to her, flying off. Solux leaves as well with Feferi and Nepeta, who arrived if her Fafeta sprite exploded. Don realizes that he still has the Ring of Life IRL, but he's not so sure about giving it to Vriska. He's annoyed, but presses on to find the treasure anyways. This treasure was once given to Caliborn as a reward for slaying his denizen. Vriska dumps it on the floor, and John sticks his hand through it. His arm gets distributed all throughout Homestuck, and he disappears. He wakes up and zaps through different Homestuck scenes, eventually arriving in the Alpha Kid session. Grimbark Jade teleports the meteor crew to John, and the intermission ends. Remember the good old metafictional disc on which Homestuck is metafictionally played? Well, we've reached the end, and there isn't another one, so Caliborn takes over the story with his own comic, Homosuck. Caliborn has achieved God tier and almost won his Spurb session. At the pinnacle of his victory, he will now satirize Homestuck. Homosuck John faffs about his cake-infested room until he's obliterated by a meteor. Caliborn accidentally toggles his caps lock and releases the Homestuck Act 6 Act 6 cartridge. He stuffs it full of candy to ensure that we can't escape Homosuck. With Caliborn in charge, the main story is now relegated to intermissions. Grimbark Jade has filled out the Alpha Kid session with the Beta Kid's planets. She rides the meteor through a portal to Earth where she shrinks the planet down and capsule logs it, but this is interrupted by shitty JPEG artifacts created by Caliborn. We last saw the trolls and Beta Kids as Grimbark Jade teleported them to John. Jade has since scattered them throughout the Alpha Kids session to complete various tasks necessary to winning the game. Remember that this will create a new universe, which the Condes, who's controlling Jade, wants to rule. On the Land of Light and Rain, Terezi and Rose nurse hangovers while hounded by JPEG artifacts. John zaps by and blows away all the shittiness. Rose directs him to get in contact with the Alpha Kids, while Terezi makes a blindfold to go clown hunting. On the Land of Frost and Frogs, Karkat and Kanai are instructed to retrieve the God Frog from Jade's denizen, Echidna. Echidna has had the frog since Jane got blown up three years ago and dropped it into the volcano. To pressure them to comply, Jane kills Karkat and resurrects him with her new God tier power, which she can only use once per person. On the Land of Heat and Clockwork, Dave is moved to comedic tears by his old ironic selfies as John zaps by. This attracts Jade, and John zaps away. Jade alchemizes a new sword for Dave, which is fated to deal a final blow to Lord English. She challenges him to a fight, purportedly to make him stronger, but really she's working through some issues from her relationship with Dave Sprite. In the background, two Johns appear. One of these Johns initially interrupted the scene, but he's interrupted by the second John. This demonstrates John's new retcon power, which lets him change the past without creating a doomed timeline. Future John tells current John to go find Roxy, and we catch up with the Alpha Kids. Dirk flies toward the session after getting teleported away by Jade. On Durst, Robo Jane fills Jake in on her post-session plans. She will rule the new universe under the Condes, with Jake as her trad husband. This stresses Jake out so much that he manifests Dream Splinter Dirk in real life. Roxy's in Durst prison again, and the Condes still wants her to make the Matri Orb. She succeeds in making a perfectly generic object, and John finds her in a fort of them. They regale each other with stories at their respective sessions, and John offers to give Roxy the Ring of Life to revive Calliope. This excites her so much that she's able to summon a fucked up Matri Orb hybrid. But when John returns to the ship to get the ring, it's gone. The intermission ends, and we're back to Homo Suck. John got blown up, so Dave's the new leading man. With an entourage of top flight females, he embarks on a quest. The real John zaps into the story and Caliborn buries him in shitty days as we hop to Act 6, Act 6, Intermission 2. Gamzee is nabbed with the Ring of Life. He's under Arania's control and she revives herself with the ring. Mina calls Arania and she explains her plan to sabotage the session to ensure that Lord English is never created. She mind controls some psychic ghost to transport herself to Durst, drawing Jane and Jade's attention. She visits Jake and uses her Sylph of Life powers to unlock his potential as the Page of Hope. The page explodes, projecting an aura that shoots off angels and gives Roxy the opportunity to escape from prison. Jade can't penetrate his Hope field,
Aronia drops Jade's house on her, killing her for real. Aronia senses Roxy sneaking up on her and puts her to sleep as Jake manifests Dream Splinter Dirk. Jane goes to revive Jade, but mind controlled Gamzee attacks. Terezi joins the fray against Gamzee, freeing Jane. But she can't get to Jade as Becknor and PM fly off with her body. Jake believes so hard that he makes Dream Splinter Dirk real, but Aronia is unkillable with the Ring of Life. Instead, Dirk uses Prince of Heart powers to rip out her soul. This diminishes Jake's hope field, making Dirk less real. Rose arrives and Dirk tells her to escape with Roxy's body. Jane takes the opportunity to fork Jake, inadvertently saving Aronia as Dirk disappears. Gamzee's mind control breaks and he enters rage mode. Aronia tries to put Jane to sleep, but her computer brain is too strong. Jake revives with his god tier immortality as Gamzee fights Terezi. As the contest pulls her ship up, Act 6, Act 6, Intermission 2 ends. Caliborn has developed a new art style. It's anime. As Caliborn inserts himself into Homo Suck, John appears and attacks. S game over begins and we jump between John fighting Caliborn and Act 6, Act 6, Intermission 3. Gamzee has beaten Terezi, but Karkat and Kanaya try to save her. Karkat is stabbed by his former Moirail and falls into lava. Kanaya slices Gamzee in half, finally ending the clown. Aronia tries to stab Jane, but Jake jumps in to save her, getting them both skewered. The Condess unleashes her laser eyes, vaporizing Kanaya. Dave is stabbed by the dogs while trying to recover Jade. Aronia rains planets down on the Condess and makes Terezi stab herself. The Condess stabs Rose and almost vaporizes her, but Roxy saves her. The Condess thrashes Aronia's ass, taking the Ring of Life and snapping her neck. John zaps away from beating Caliborn and into the aftermath as the intermission ends. John's beating has inspired Caliborn to reinvent himself as an artist. In Act 6, Act 6, Intermission 4, John flies through the fucked up Spurb session. The planets are in disarray and JPEG artifacts are everywhere. John follows Roxy to her planet where Rose dies a heroic death. Roxy is ready to give up, but Terezi crash lands with a plan. She directs John to use his zap power and go back in time to change things. He can't control it though, so Roxy suggests he go see his denizen for help, and she'll go see hers as well. On his planet, John meets Typhius and learns to control his power by saving himself from drowning in oil. He completes his personal quest, freeing the fireflies from beneath the clouds, clearing out the gunk from the Homestuck cartridge, and zapping his planet away from the session. John finds Roxy, who was told by her denizen to make her way to his planet so she wouldn't be left behind. As John zaps off to fix the timeline, Roxy holds a funeral for Rose and is comforted by Jasper's sprite. John doesn't know where to go at first, but hones in on a recent memory of Terezi. She gives him a list of instructions and past mistakes to fix, and we double back through old pages of the comic. John zaps back to when everyone is reunited and grabs the Ring of Life before Aronia can get to it. He jumps through other scenes in Terezi's past, ultimately saving Briska's life before returning to his planet. There, he zaps the entire thing into the new timeline. Meanwhile, Jade has arrived in Calliope's super secret dream bubble. She doesn't remember dying, and as we'll find out, she's actually alive and well. This is the Jade from the new timeline. Callie creates a troll Sona for Jade, and Jade realizes that she's met Calliope before, just not this version of her. The Calliope Jade met was a god tier who predominated over Caliborn. This is the version of herself that Callie has been looking for. In this Jade's timeline, John's entire planet exploded during their three-year journey, killing him. Jane wanders into the Jade Calliope dream party and creates her own Trollsona. These three recount the ways in which the new timeline has changed. When Grimbark Jade surprised the meteor crew, Vriska put her to sleep. As the kids executed a prison break, mind-controlled Jane killed Roxy, but this is okay because John's bringing the old timeline's Roxy with him. Jade and Jane are both sleeping now as the residents of the new timeline formulate a plan. Throughout all this, we catch up with Mina and the original Vriska. They're upset about Irania ditching them and abandon their quest to kill Lord English. They hang out and fall in lesbians. Caliborn is back at the helm for Act 6, Act 6, Act 5, showcasing his masterpiece. In Claymation, Caliborn renders a future fight between him and the Alpha and Beta kids. He uses his treasure from defeating Yana Baoth to seal away the Beta kids and uses the Ring of Void to banish it. However, Jake delivers Caliborn's first defeat using his Hope Aura and Dirk tries to tear out his soul. As Arqueous Sprite holds Caliborn down, their souls get entangled with Gamzees and stuffed inside Lil Cow, creating Lord English. Roxy banishes Lil Cow into the Void and Caliborn signs off to go fight Yana Baoth. In Act 6, Act 6, Intermission 5, Vriska is back. Having her around changed some stuff. Gamzee and Terezi never dated, Vriska and Terezi became Moirails, and Karkat and Dave are in a relationship. Vriska prototyped Tavros and Jane's sprite and created Arqueous sprite, but Roxy and Jake's sprites haven't been prototyped. In this happier timeline, everyone chats while orbiting Skya, awaiting John's arrival. Jade and Jane are asleep, and Arqueous sprite is working to disable the mind-controlling tiara top. John and Roxy arrive, replacing their dead selves in this timeline. The kids have several hours to catch up before the villains collide for the final battle. Dave waxes about sexuality, and Karkat convinces John that he's harboring polygonous feelings for Terezi. Rose and Roxy meet and bond over alcoholism and mother-daughter relationships. Tavro Sprite gives Jake a page-to-page -page pep talk. Dave and Roxy exchange lightning round questions to Rose's amusement. Jasper Sprite digs up Rose's body from the old timeline and creates Rose Sprite. Throughout all this, Gamzee is locked up in a fridge with the other trolls' corpses. Riska calls a tactical meeting to order. The upcoming fight will have four adversaries, the Condess and three versions of Jack Noir. The kids will intercept each adversary at key points while Jane bounces throughout the session providing healing. Roxy, Rose, and John will face the Condess on Durst. Dave, Terezi, and Dirk will fight the Lord English version of Jack. Jake will handle Robot Jack and the Felt. Dog Jack should be occupied by PM, but Jade will join the fight if she wakes up. Park and Kanaya must talk to Jade's denizen, Echidna, to retrieve the Godfrog. Briska will travel to the furthest ring to fight Lord English, but first she has to get the treasure from Mina and the original Briska. Briska shoots a fenestrated wall at Dirk to bring him into the fray and absconds to the furthest ring. Calliope is about to awaken Jane and Jade when her dream bubble goes wacky. They fall into a memory of Echidna's lair and Jane awakens. Excited by all the reuniting, Jasper Sprite nuzzles Rose Sprite, who hasn't been prototyped a second time, creating Jasper Sprite squared. God tier Calliope greets Callie and Jade and speaks to Calliope alone. This Calliope predominated over Caliborn but was unable to win her single player session of Spur. She's been awaiting Callie's arrival and sets off toward the the green sun with Jade. As they depart, Roxy appears and gives Calliope the Ring of Life, and they return.
return to the land of the living. Once everyone has met Calliope, Roxy pulls her aside. With her help, Roxy successfully materializes the Matri Orb. Karkat and Kanaya had a successful conversation with Echidna. She's agreed to release the God Frog, and the conversations left Kanaya optimistic about the fate of her people. She knocks Karkat out, believing that he must survive the upcoming battle to lead the new troll species. Roxy surprises Kanaya with the Matri Orb, moving her to tears. Jasper's Red Square jaunts around the session, fondling Calliope, nuzzling Kanaya, and interrupting Dave and Dirk. These last two have been sitting in awkward silence, unsure of how to talk to each other. Dave admits that he didn't like his bro very much and was neglected throughout his childhood. He and Dirk have a feelings jam that ends in a hug. Jasper Sprite Squared isn't done being a menace. She introduces Jane to Nana Sprite, who gives her an inspirational talk. There are actually two Nana Sprites now, the one from John's timeline and this one. Jasper Sprite Squared's last stop is on Jake's planet, where Jake is busy having negative character development with Tabro Sprite. Jasper Sprite Squared prototypes Nepeta in the last empty Colonel Sprite. Briska calls Jake and engineers a situation that causes G-Cat to get prototyped in Tabro Sprite. Tabros is now allergic to himself and wielding God power, but Briska puts him to sleep, neutralizing G-Cat as a threat. Jasper Sprite Squared takes Nepeta Sprite on a date, but they're interrupted by Dave Sprite from John's timeline. He shakes hands with Nepeta Sprite and creates Dave Peta Sprite Squared. They take a second to resolve their confusing existence before reuniting with Arqueous Sprite and flying off to fight Lord English. They run into Jade in the furthest ring, who's followed God Tier Calliope to the Green Sun. Dave Peta Sprite Squared kisses her goodbye before waking her up. Jade reads a note from Dave and teleports over to say hi, even though she's supposed to be asleep. Also in the furthest ring, a live Vriska tracks down Mina and Dead Vriska. She says cruel things to Dead Vriska, making her cry and takes the treasure. Mina decides to join Living Vriska, leaving Dead Vriska to wander off alone. Mina and Vriska run into Tavros, who's amassed a ghost army. He celebrates finally doing something useful, and Mina takes charge of the ghosts. Sleeping Karkat joins the army, prepared to fight in the first line. Arqueous Sprite has built up the houses and deployed Grist Rigs to get Skya ready for the God Frog's arrival. All that's left now is to light the forge with the Monarch's rings. Terezi calls Riska and spills her feelings as the flash animation gives us a timeline of their friendship. We see the original timeline kids awaken in the dream bubbles, giving us a final moment of closure for many of Homestuck's characters. Robot Jack drops his oven of accomplices on Jake and chases after Lord English Jack. The contest faces down the team on Durse. The two dogs lock eyes on Ruined Prospect. Lord English lands in front of the army. Caliborn approaches his denizen. Opposing sides face each other throughout Paradox Space, and finally, Collide. S Collide is Homestuck's big final battle. Karkat leads the charge to Lord English and gets vaporized. The contest gives the kids a psychic beatdown. John and Rose get in a fray motif, and Roxy summons some perfectly generic objects. Jake struggles to make a dent in the time traveling felt. Cans punches the battle over to Jade's planet, where Karkat takes on Clover. They end up back on Jake's planet, where Crowbar shoots him dead. The healing crew restores the team on Durst, and Jane revives Jake. They take out the contest all together, and John freezes her in time for a second, letting them pile on damage. Robo Jack and Lord Jack fight each other just as much as they fight the kids. Dirk dies, but David Terezi perform a fray motif to revive him. Dirk tries to tear out Lord Jack's soul, but he's too powerful. Arqueous Sprite and Cans brawl through the battlefield. Daddy Crocker gives Cans a humorous thrashing. The god dogs collide in Prospect's ruins to Jade's distress. Caliborn bludgeons Yadabeoth. He's victorious and destroys his god tier clock, claiming true immortality. Serenity the Firefly jaunts across the session as the kids are at their lowest, reuniting with WV. Lord English thrashes the ghost army. Despite good hits from Aradia, Tavros, and Mina, he's still invulnerable. Dave Pettisprite Square joins in and references Undertale. The contest has Jane by the throat. As the various villains prepare for the final round, we reminisce about how far the beta kids have come. Everyone takes a bad hit. Jake defeats the felt, and Karkat hogties Clover. Daddy Crocker KOs cans. Jade hops between the dogs until PM gets fed up, knocking her out and besting Becknor. Dirk gets stuck in the front of a choking centipede. Dave decapitates Dirk and both Jacks in one fell swoop as he time travels with Terezi to collect Dirk's body before Jack's head explodes the planet. As the contest threatens John Rose and Kanaya, Roxy deals the final blow with a katana from the original timeline. Act 6 ends in triumph. In the aftermath, of S Collide, Nana Sprite heals Jane, who in turn revives Dirk. Jade is reunited with Calliope, who's befriended Miss Paint. PM doffs the Queen's ring and reunites with WV. They set out to destroy the rings. The whole team converges on the door that they'll enter to claim their ultimate reward. John is loosely reunited with his father as he meets Daddy Crocker. Act 7 is a single flash animation. God tier Calliope creates a black hole that sucks up the green sun in the furthest ring. PM and WV burn the rings, freeing the God Frog. The Genesis Frog matures and releases the vast croak. As Lord English continues to destroy the army, Vriska approaches with the treasure. She opens it, and while the outcome is never explicitly revealed, I'm going to pretend that it releases the kids to defeat Lord English. Jade deploys Earth in the new universe, and the kids return home as WV plans a new can town. John opens the door and unlocks this new world. Homestuck officially ends here, but the credits reveal more of life on New Earth. With ectobiology equipment, the kids repopulate their species. They jump 5,000 years into the future to an Earth occupied by humans, trolls, carapaceans, and consorts. Kanaya and Rose get human married. Terezi searches for Vriska in the destroyed furthest ring. Jane as resurrected Crocker Corp and Jake's ass is on TV. Kanaya and Rose tend to the new Mother Grub. On John's 20th birthday, he's jeered one last time by Caliborn, and everyone lived happily forever without any epilogues or expanded canon content ever being released. Thanks for playing!